internet working, we're here. We have complicated setup of two laptops, one iPhone, lots of live real people, some of them wearing amazing socks, um, <laughs> three fantastic panelists. Uh, apologies to everyone for starting late, but we are here very excited after London Book Fair, running high on London Book Fair, Book Adrenaline, which is special type of adrenaline. So good evening, I'm Patrick Ivazian, I'm the director of the Armenian Institute, and we're very, very lucky to have these three amazing people from different countries, different organizations to sit here with us. And before we start the panel, I think my colleague Nush is going to show real people, so people on Zoom can see what's happening here. And we have a nice selection of books. And my highlight of the week has been receiving an email from Razmi Kamosian saying, all the books that the Bank and Foundation brought to uh, the fair are coming to the Institute's library, which was fantastic early Christmas present. There are, some of them are on the table, feel free to browse. As I said, I was too lazy to carry them back. <laughs> <laughs> Say that I was positioning in the Armenian no, Institute. It, it, I actually brought them to leave them to the Armenian Institute. I we had yeah. a few nice presents from your uh, Arabic publications as well, which is fantastic. We're very grateful. And uh, in a true Armenian event spirit, someone is arriving late, always the case. So I think we do want to show some of the books. Rasmik, do you want to show a few of them right now? No, when I speak, I'm going to point out to some of these or point them out, but these are some of the books that we brought. Brilliant. Okay, let's meet these people behind the books. Rasmik Panosian, Arvid Ashkaryan, Olivia Katranjian. And instead of me represent, uh, talking about their biographies, what I ask everyone to do to talk about themselves for a few minutes and organizations you run and why you were at book fair. Okay, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, my name is Rasmin Kranosian. I am the director of the Armenian Communities Department at the Carlos Gilbengian Foundation, which is in Lisbon. It's a Portuguese foundation and it has an Armenian department uh, which does work in four principal areas. One of them, the, the biggest one being uh, working on the Armenian diaspora, on language, education, school support, uh, research with an emphasis on Western Armenian. And of course, publications fall into that category. We also work on, um, uh, in Armenia, we give university scholarships and we also do some work on Armenian-Turkish relations dialogue. Um, myself, I am Canadian. I grew up in Canada, in English Canada, worked in French Canada, studied in London, where the, when the Armenian Institute was being formed, uh, I was one of the people who, were, who was there carrying books. So books is always a constant <laughs> theme of my life being, you know, carrying them. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then uh, I, I work in various other domains. And then nine years ago, I came to the foundation and uh, have, been at, have been at the foundation for nine years now, working closely with Mr. Martin Esayan, who's one of our trustees. Uh, so that is a little bit about me and the, and the foundation. If, we, much, if any of you come to Lisbon, please come and visit uh, the uh, wonderful museum that uh, we have. That is the work, the collection of Carlos Gulbegian himself. Thank you very much, Rasmus. And all the way from Yerevan, yes. Aravikash Haran. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am Aravikash Haran. I am a literary agent for around 10 years now, and I am the founder of Ari Literary and Talent Agency and Ari Literature Foundation. So our main aim in both of these organizations is to promote Armenian literature worldwide, to get it translated, published in as many languages as possible. For that, we are here, and we're so glad that at last this book fair happened with the help of people here, Sharv and Razmik, Gulbenkian Foundation, who this year supported this event. Uh, so uh, on the foundation side, we are implementing uh, projects which are aimed at 
creating the missing infrastructure of the publishing industry in Armenia, such as uh, Publishers Association, Translators Association, we're still trying to do that and we will succeed, I'm sure, in some time. But otherwise we implement projects, um, creative writing projects for young writers, uh, international camps. We invite people to Armenia. Our wonderful project is called Write in Armenia, and we have hosted uh, young writers from around six, seven countries by now. And then we also implement reading promotion projects in Armenia for young children. We are in great cooperation with Kalustun Benkian Foundation. We coordinate uh, translations, Kalustun Benkian translation series of contemporary philosophers into Armenian. This is an exceptional work that is being done in Armenia for the first time, bringing these important names in Armenian translation to the academia and readers in Armenia. Um, this is mainly all that we do. I am sorry, it sounds it's a little a lot. bit, it's a <laughs> lot, but unfortunately um, you can't just do one thing, especially when you are a literary agent for Armenian literature. You have to have a background, you have to be, to be able to lay, you know, to lay on a system, which unfortunately doesn't exist. So you have to first create it and then make it help you do your job. But um, I'm happy to say we have around 15 translations by now into English, French, um, Bulgarian, Serbian, Turkish, Ukrainian, Albanian, by the way. We're now expecting uh, Arabic translations uh, and uh, some more that's, yes, German, very important language. So I think it's a success. Few names, but it's for us, it's a huge success. So oh, we're happy fantastic. to go on. It's fantastic being Alex and your colleague Anna's neighbor book fair. I've seen how busy you were. No, so I can make an appointment to have coffee with her. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty busy. My next guest, Oliver Hafrangian, who is not a publisher, but a very literary person and founder of my favorite literary organization. Thank Olivia. you. Uh, I'm Olivia Katrangian. Thank you so much for having me uh, here. It's a pleasure to be with both of you. Uh, I'm a writer and journalist. I started in travel writing and became a daily news reporter and, and made documentary films for the New York Times before switching gears and, and becoming a novelist. Uh, I study at uh, creative writing at Oxford University and I'm the founder of the International Armenian Literary Alliance, which is a global uh, platform to support Armenian writers. Uh, we launched last March and in our, in our inaugural year, we uh, hosted a mentorship program that matched 11 emerging Armenian writers with published authors to guide them for two months over the summer. We hosted a uh, poetry competition for uh, Armenian high school students to encourage young people to write creatively. Uh, we hosted an essay competition with Oxford University and published the winning essays in a uh, literary magazine out of Beirut. Um, we've created a critique group for members to exchange work and give each other feedback. Um, we've hosted panel discussions and readings with the Armenian Institute and groundbreaking programming. Like uh, last June, we hosted two events dedicated to queer Armenian literature. Uh, that the one of the events was a panel that uh, brought together queer Armenian writers from all over the world for the first time uh, to discuss their work. And so in our second year, we are, uh, sorry, I should have brought my daughter, but mm -hmm. in our second year, we are, <laughs> we are uh, going to launch two grants, one for the translation of Armenian literature and one for creating a new uh, piece of fiction this year. And we hope to expand to other genres in the future. Uh, we're, we're really excited to be here and have partnerships with the Armenian Institute and places like the Glendale Library Arts and Culture Association. And um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's been just an absolute pleasure to meet so many Armenian writers through this, this organization and come together and support each other and read each other's work and um, meet people like Tatavik and Aravik and Razmik. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope you've done so much. We need a few sessions to just cover <laughs> all the work and all the things you're doing. Um, 
I have a few first obvious questions, but there's a question we talk about, and I know all of you have different ideas. So um, I'm a bit worried about asking this, <laughs> but shall we try to define what Armenian literature? <laughs> no, we should not ask yeah. that question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question, should, that, should we ask that question, or all of us understand it in our own way, or shall we all say how we understand it? Just for people, our viewers even, to think about. Uh, no fights, no punching. <laughs> no, just, no, 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 of course. I we had this conversation. We have already. had this conversation many <laughs> times. I no. believe that Armenian literature is a literature that, that um, represents the multiplicity of identities um, that make up Arme the Armenian people across cultures and countries. Um, I am a founder and president of an Armenian organization who does not speak Armenian. So I, you know, have a little bit of a different understanding of Armenian literature than Aravik does. Um, but I, of course, am excited to read literature and translation, but I also believe that there are a myriad, um, uh, you know, types of Armenian literature and we should celebrate uh, all of them. Uh, first of all, I think that we don't have that much quantity of books, literature, and writers to limit ourselves to some, you know, terms. So I am happy to share this idea with uh, Olivia that everything written by Armenians or about Armenians, Armenian culture and Armenians can be considered an Armenian literature. But because I work with publishers, every time this question is like, it, it arises and it's very clear. To me, Armenian literature is the literature written in Armenian language. And not only to me, but professionally speaking, when we say Armenian literature, we mean writing in Armenia. We were discussing this with Datavik. We have two wonderful writers of Armenian origin who lived, were born and lived in Armenia, but they write in Russian and they were published and very successful in Russian and they are considered unfortunately Russian writers. So yeah, yeah. in short, yeah, to, like two of them really big names, not only in Russia and Armenia, but also worldwide. Anyway, for, for me, it's very important to promote Armenian literature written in Armenian language, because it is also about kind of, you know, the text which has been written in Armenian language. This is what's important to the publishers I work with as well. I have tried representing writers of Armenian origin writing in other languages, but there is less interest towards that under the name of Armenian literature than uh, those who write in Armenian language. Thank you. I see or people also now tell you that I can see different sections <laughs> of the audience nodding to different <laughs> things. Thing, yeah. And I would encourage everyone on Zoom, please uh, share your views. In the I think Rasmik wanted to say well, something. Yeah, yeah. Rasmik. <laughs> um, I actually don't define it, and I, I don't want to define it. That's an easy way out. It's an easy way out, <laughs> but I do want to explain that we should not conflate certain, certain ideas together. Armenian identity is different, Armenian literature is different, um, Armenian history is different. One can be Armenian without the language. One can have, uh, uh, you know, the language without being Armenian. There are some, you know, people who are speak Armenian, but they're not Armenian. So there are different ways of being Armenian and different elements of this question of what is Armenian literature. Um, and the reason I don't define it is because I cannot defend any one position uh, convincingly. I cannot define. I cannot defend uh, the thesis that Armenian literature can only be in Armenian. What if someone is writing about Armenian subjects? Like, you know, we, we consider William Sarian as part of Armenian literature, but others would say, no, that's American literature with Armenian themes. Um, so I wouldn't, the reason I don't define it is because I don't want to see such a radical distinction between, between the languages. Now, the other element of which I'm absolutely insisting on and consistent is that Armenian language is something that should be maintained and, uh, and uh, revitalized and cherished and supported in the diaspora. That's why we do have a lot of programs on Western Armenian. And so the work that we do is 
on supporting the publication of Armenian language literature, but that's not the only work that we do. I mean, we also publish books that are not in Armenian that, have, uh, that are related to Armenian history, identity, and culture. So I don't really sort of radically put, it, put things in, in boxes in that respect. And uh, uh, it gives me tremendous degree of flexibility to actually <laughs> pick and choose things. <laughs> so. Very, very wise answer, very yeah. wise and diplomatic. I appreciate that. And I, it, it's an interesting question when you think of it in terms of a book like The 40 Days of Musa Da, which you could argue is the most famous genocide yeah. story. Um, you know where would that go in 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 our in our categorizations? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't heard of people considering that as part of Armenian literature. Oh. It's part of uh, it's part of Armenian. But it's history. an Armenian story. Ar it's Armenian an Armenian theme, story, but... Armenian theme. But I haven't heard people say that it's part of Armenian literature because, I mean, Armenians have a very ethnic identity of ethnic sense of identity, right? So it's a uh, uh, if. Franz Varfel is never considered Armenian. Uh, uh, Armen Armenian expert, uh, you know, experts of Armenian history who might be fluent in Armenian are not considered Armenian. They're considered experts of Armenian. So um, yeah, and then we constantly have to deal with these different categories. And partly because we are a diaspora nation, we speak so many languages, right? If someone in Buenos Aires is writing in Spanish about the Armenian community in the literary, literary writing in, in Argentina. Is that Armenian literature? Is not that Armenian literature? And I don't know. And, and that's why I, I, I don't want to give a clear answer. Uh, it could be, it, the same thing could be said about music. What's Armenian music? What's not Armenian music? Levon will have a definition, but someone else will have another definition, for example. So, um, and I think we, being diaspora, is navigating all these different definitions and identities. That's true. That's true. Now we settled this. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> now we know all the answers. Um, three of you very conveniently represent sort of three language strands. I want to talk about. You specialize in Western Armenian publications. Mm. You're based in Armenia, in Eastern Armenia mostly, and mostly. your writers are mostly English language and what i want to ask in whatever your understanding and definition is of armenian literature and armenian publishing in general not only literary works are there any trends what are we reading or we're trying to just desperately to publish whatever we can is there a coherence do you see any mm. particular patterns emerging what are people reading because i was looking around at London Book Fair, it's, it's amazing variety of books. You have heavy historical works, children's books, contemporary novels. Um, and Yala's writers, what do they represent? One thing that has been wonderful is to discover so many writers in different genres. So we've, we've, our members include science fiction writers, young adult novelists. Uh, on our panel last year, we had uh, a a man who writes queer young adult fiction, uh, which you wouldn't think of as your typical, you know, Armenian literature, but um, he, he's been very successful. Uh, we have literary novelists, we have many, many poets, as you know. Uh, so I think something that's uh, really interesting is that I, Armenian writers are moving sort of after a very long time of writing um, that's focused on the genocide, which of course is hugely important for a number of reasons. Uh, I think we're moving away from that in a, in a way and, and exploring more contemporary issues that, and, and, and other genres. Um, and so this goes back to the question of what is Armenian literature? If an Armenian author writes a fantasy novel, um, is that Armenian literature? If it doesn't have Armenian characters, I, I, I would say. Well, yeah, sure, but uh, um, yeah, I think is it's... there an de academic definition of what is a national literature is like? There should be. I mean, the literature written in a language is considered. There should be. There should be. It's, it's, it's usually language driven. Of course, it's usually it's the usually language. language. language you know. But yeah. No, I fully agree on not but, limiting on that, but yeah. <laughs> but for example, there is French literature and there is Quebecois literature, and it's very distinct. 
well, distinct, not very distinct. The language is the same, except there are some differences, but Quebecois literature is pertaining to the French speaking province of Canada. Different themes, different yeah. issues. Yeah. In France, in Germany, there are recently uh, many migrant writers from all over the world, and they all write in French, and this is considered French literature still mm. they are from like alger and you know other countries uh, of uh, east and africa and it's still the uh, language mm. okay let me answer yeah your question about what writers write and what readers read uh, mm -hmm. in terms of armenia um 10 years ago in around in the beginning of 2010 slightly before that a very new trend in Armenian literature started in Armenia, a generation, a group of writers, which we, uh, we call them generation independence writers. And um, they are still very trendy. They are still very famous in Armenia due to the styles, language and topics that they have chosen. So these are mostly people in their 40s, a little bit over or less. And um, they have started a very new discourse around what is Armenian literature. First of all, it's the language. They, have, they are using more um, spoken language, not slang. No, I want to say that it's like spoken Armenian language. Armenian language has always been like very high in literature and very like spoken in, in our um, daily life. Now it's coming kind of closer to each other which is very good. It um, extends the number of lead, uh, readers. It doesn't limit the readership. Uh, secondly, it's the topics, uh, very critical towards many aspects of our life, politics, um, society, traditional values sometimes. So it's also very new. And then uh, of course, like queer issues, LGBT topics which I was mentioning this during my conversations, my um, meetings with the publishers. It's not about the topic, it's more about creating the language. So this current literature is trying to create the language of speaking about contemporary topics, mm. including LGBT and many, many other things, many daily issues which were never written in literature. So, uh, this is what is being written in Armenia, and um, the readers are very interested in that. Um, also, translated literature, mainly famous names. We had the, this huge gap of translated literature in Armenia, so now publishers are kind of filling in the gap of this uh, not translated writers. Uh, and slowly we're coming close to translating those who appear and uh, premiere nowadays from other languages. So just in short, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> Mars, where are you? you have your poets, you have your contemporary generation independence. I think you came up with the definition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not only me, not like alone, but yes, yeah. we kind of defined what yeah. is the generation independence of Armenian literature. Yeah. Don't ask me, you're in a unique position because you're not publishers, but you support publishers. Mm -hmm. And how do you choose what gets published, what is necessary? Uh, that's a very good question and a very tough question. Yeah. But coming back to your earlier question of what are people <laughs> reading, I will start with that and then sort of go into the other one. Uh, that if it could give an answer in Armenia, what are people reading because she sees the market and sees the trends, statistics. That question is impossible to uh, answer in the diaspora because we can answer the question, what, what is being published, what is being written, but what is being read, we don't know. There is no research being done on that. We're commissioning a small research project in Los Angeles so that we know what's what the demand in Los Angeles area is uh, in terms of Armenian language. But we do know that mostly they're not reading in Armenia. So then, then there's a question of what kind of a market do you create in order for people to read? Now, coming to your second question as to uh, what as a department uh, we publish, um, there is the whole side of, I would not, I would not address right now, um, 
the whole side of digitization and and uh, making things available as ebooks or or online so there is a quite a large segment of our work is in is in that making a Agopo Shagan available online and uh, various other writers and uh, volume you know we support projects like like volume digital uh, and whatnot um, in terms of selecting printed books um, we have a preference for books in Western Armenia. So we publish, even though the readership might be very small, we feel that it's important to print and publish and disseminate books in Western Armenian that are being written now. So some of them you see here, uh, uh, some of them are fiction, some of them are essays, like Gum is an, uh, is an essay, uh, essays, Belidian's uh, works are fiction. And so there is that genre. Then we support the publication of what we consider strategically important books in whatever language. Uh, you know, I can show you, for example, um, this is Tani Rakhchan's uh, book in, in, uh, in English and in Turkish. We would support this kind of thing because the research that he's doing is very valuable and important strategically for Ar Armenians. Um, then we have a series uh, on children's books, Ar Western Armenian children's books. Uh, and again, I have some uh, examples here. And this is our own, uh, our own uh, series, the Zarte series. We're not the publisher. We work with two other publishers. But the series itself, these are translations. So it's children's, world-famous children's literature that's not available in Armenian. So we translate it in Western Armenian. Um, so that's, uh, that's some of the other things we do, um, there is a whole translation series that I'll talk about later if you, if you ask, if there's a question about translation. Um, you know, there is the, as I said, uh, the Western Armenian literature. These are, by the way, being published in Armenia and there is lots of readership in Armenia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Armenia of Western Armenian literature. Um, the philosophy books, then sometimes we do like Fun books, uh, Little Armenias. This is this is like a, a book of uh, someone who went to all the Armenian communities, not all, most of the Armenian communities in some hundred and odd countries, and wrote little blurbs about about uh, each community. It's a fun book. It's something you give as as a present, um, and there is a logic to it because we like to tell the story of the diaspora. We like to emphasize research and. The, and uh, assert diasporan identity. And these kind of things fits into that. Um, there is the, as I said, the translations book, the philosophy books. Um, and then there are books that, uh, this is a translation we publish just to annoy people. And this is uh, Nietzsche's Antichrist in Armenia. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, uh, so. The so, <laughs> I can, so the demand for this might not be great, but it's good to have you know, Nietzsche's Antichrist in, in Armenia, in Western Armenia. If anyone wants to read it, so now it's but, now Armenian Institute's library. You're welcome to come and read. So, uh, but that really, the serious point I want to make is that what we publish is not, the logic is not market driven. It's, it's a different logic. It's a, it's a logic that this literature should exist in Armenian. Uh, and then even if it satisfies 50 people in this world, it's important for this literature to exist in Armenian, the translations. And we hope, I think in Armenia, it will be read. Yeah, you know, Nietzsche's books and philosophy books will be read in Armenia. Very optimistic. Yeah. No, it's wonderful to hear all these yeah. plans. It's wonderful. And what I love about all your work, what three of you are doing, is not like you say market driven. It's you all have a vision and you have hopes and dreams. And you talked about your plans. What what do you wish for for Yala? What sort of literary developments would make you happy and make your writers happy? Oh. I mean, I think a lot of people struggle to get published and right now there is a trend across i'll speak to the united states because i'm an american i know it the best but there's a trend across the major publishing houses to become more diverse since uh in the last two years but in a big way but in in the last five to ten years in a much smaller way 
but that will happen very, very slowly. So I think I know of one Armenian editor at a publishing house. Um, I think I know of one Armenian literary agent. So the publishing world is not um, currently very diverse. And I think that affects what stories are bought and uh, published. And so I think you know, a lot of Armenian writers are are struggling to make the best work they can and and get published. And I think part of what we're trying to do through Yala is to come together to support each other because a lot of this world is about connections and and introducing people to you know and and reading each other's work and helping each other make it the best it can be. And so, I don't want to say I want to see more um, literary feminist novels. But uh, why, not? why not? No, I, I want I want people to write what they uh, are passionate about because what I do writing novels is such a long process that if on year three you're tired of the idea, it's not it's not going to work. You're not going to make it to year six when it's and you're you know you're not going to make it to me year nine when you're on your seventeenth draft. Well, <laughs> so I really want to see people, you know write about subjects that are exciting to them that they're interested in exploring and and whatever that may be because I think that creates the best work um as Rosnick said it's, it's it's not a it can't be a market driven thing if you if you think that people want to see more gone girls or whatever um you know psychological thrillers and you write that but your heart's not in it it won't it won't work yeah. it won't work so yeah yeah, yeah. I can I think your best place to explain what goes on the background in terms of publishing and distribution and agents because they all have ideas about the creative side, but yeah. there's a lot of hard work going behind the scenes. And uh, of course, and to get the situation better, what I would wish for, as you <laughs> asked the question, is to kind of combine the efforts of Eastern and Western Armenians in this matter to uh, make the field more healthy. We just need to do that. I mean, uh, we have to read each, read each other. We have to translate from all the languages into each other to be able to read, to know what's going on in the literary scene. Technically, it's very difficult, of course, but uh, getting together all these efforts is very, very important. One of the efforts is actually this London Book Fair when we have one pavilion with Eastern Armenian books, Western Armenian books, publishers from Armenia, from all over the world, representing Armenian publishing fields are present. Uh, what we lack actually is the interest towards whatever is called Armenian literature and written in any language. Uh, interest Firstly, from the Armenian people from all over the world, the diaspora, because I don't feel that they read what is written by Armenians around the world. And uh, secondly, interest towards Armenia, the word Armenia from other countries, from other publishers all over the world. Uh, when we come to the book fair, it feels like sometimes, most of the times we have to tell from like, ground zero, who we are, do we have a language, do we have letters, are we Christian or not? I usually answer this kind of questions. And it's really very disappointing because from inside, we think that we are very well known. Everybody knows Armenia. William Sarayan, Sharlan Zdaur. Yes, people know these names, but not as Armenians. So uh, first of all, we need to think about like, how we want to be known to the world and answer this question, each of us in our way. That will solve the smaller problems that you mentioned, like how it works from the inside the industry. Yeah. And I wanted to add to this that uh, as Rosmik said, uh, none of us actually is doing a commercial kind of projects, commerce oriented, as you said. Mm. The book market doesn't work that way. You create a like, proposal, mm -hmm. you create the market and you raise the demand by that. You don't go after the demand, but it's just working vice versa. I mean, when you translate these books into Armenian, then people appear to buy and read it. Yeah. 
because yeah. because now it's available yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't work the other way no that's that's a very good point and i've seen all your organizations creating this demand making people thirsty for Stingella hosting all the wonderful poetry events mm. i don't know anyone even my mother who will choose to go to a bookshop and spend hours and choose a tiny Armenian poetry collection but if there is an event there's a launch there's it's represented there's a bit of a reading you need to generate the interest and uh, if you maybe publish enough niche with nice covers people will start <laughs> picking it up um, a wonderful thing Arabic I love looking at your books uh, I'll find a few later to show people on zoom and uh, maybe can share some links on uh, zoom as well for people to see what I loved, something interesting, you again creating the demand, uh, wonderful children's books with Western and Eastern Armenian next to each other. Yeah. I think it's so mm -hmm. wonderful, the kid opening yeah, it's it, whether really, in yeah. Armenia or in diaspora. And it's just normalizing seeing the languages next to each other because I'm sure we've all had conversations about the importance of this and this one is a dialect and this one is more important and suddenly it's happening again and again and yes. i think your solution is just the most beautiful elegant solution here's a book in our what beautiful languages yeah uh, there is another very interesting solution uh, which was uh, done by volume that uh, rasmik mentioned another mm -hmm. project supported by gulbenkian of audiobooks and um, ebooks and audiobooks so this is an animation uh, which is translated into both languages, Eastern and Western. And I first thought that there will be like two versions of it, but eventually they did one animation with some characters speaking Eastern mm. Armenian, mm -hmm. other characters speaking Western Armenian. Uh -huh. This is a wonderful the, solution. The yes, the, 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 the Treasure country, Island, the Treasure Island, Island yeah. the Japanese animation translated into Armenian. And it doesn't give you a choice. It doesn't give a child a choice to choose Eastern or Western. So he watches and in a very natural way, he starts to understand that some people speak Eastern Armenian and the others Western Armenian, and he understands both. So we recently did a reading for Eastern Armenian children, Eastern Armenian speaking children. We read a Western Armenian children's books and it was like amazing because they suddenly could understand everything, but they thought they won't. And apparently it's like one and the same language and it doesn't matter, the story matters. The language doesn't matter, Eastern or Western. So you see more of an increase in demand in Western Armenian books in, obviously we have a lot of people moving to Armenia from Syria and Lebanon and uh, a lot of people Asia are Lebanon, moving, yeah. yes. And uh, we actually started doing it once we started working with Western Armenian speaking people. Like first it was William, now it's uh, Gulbenkian Foundation. So we suddenly we understood it's really very important. We never paid so much attention to that. It was like, you know, separate languages. Now, obviously, for example, the the um, philosophy books that are being translated within Gulbenkian series, two of them are in Western Armenian. People will have to read it in Western Armenian because Eastern Armenian won't be available. Nobody will translate these difficult books into Eastern Armenian when Western exists. It means that people will have to overcome and mm -hmm. In some time, in a couple of years, I'm sure it won't be a problem. And Western Armenian academicians or students will have to read the Eastern Armenian of these translations. So um, I kind of see the solution. And the solution is just disregard these dialects and use whatever you have at hand, if you need the knowledge or the story or you know the book. In addition to the dialect, Western and Eastern Armenia. In Western Armenia, there is a huge treasury of literature that has been produced over the last 200 years. And we keep talking about the language, the Western Armenian language, as if we're talking about the tool, but we're not talking about this huge legacy that we have, you know, from the mm -hmm. uh, 19th century in also, you know, Zaton Kishachan and all mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous We talk of about that and we deal with that. That <laughs> people in Armenia yeah. are mostly not familiar with this uh, 
literature. Mm -hmm. So I think there is also uh, some things or we need to also think about how can we make this not just a matter of dialect but as such, culture, but that a matter of getting to commune and have access to this literature, which mm -hmm. is part of our history in the last 200 years. Yes. First of all, we have the books here available to, uh, of the writers you mentioned, of the, you know, uh, reprinted in Western Armenian, in Armenia, and available in the bookstore. And secondly, it's the volume ebook application, which has like 60% of the books mm -hmm. are those that you mentioned, yeah. Bolso <clears throat> literature, uh, some literature, Armenian literature available now for like everybody, not only in Armenia, but the world. A lot of that is now digitized so that that classical literature is available uh, mostly freely. But uh, what uh, that David was mentioning, uh, you know, some of this social science philosophy books being translated into um, into Eastern and Western Armenian. Uh, the Western Armenian is, uh, is just to say concretely what it is. It's Edward Said's Orientalism which doesn't exist in Armenian. So now it's going to be available in Armenian for the first time and it's going to be in Western Armenian. So anyone who wants to read Edward Said has to read it in Western Armenian. Uh, Agamben as well, it's in Western Armenian. Nietzsche, you know, there is probably Nietzsche in Western Armenian as well. So uh, um, uh, it's part of the... Yeah, yeah, there, there's more. I have, I have some more. I have, I have, I have some more here. So, uh, so it's important, but... Um, I think I think there is something that Herak said that should be taken into account, uh, and it's that a lot more new literature is being written in Eastern Armenian than in Western Armenian, mm -hmm. and I think that is also a problem. What to do to encourage people to write? Because Western Armenian literature should not just be about the past and about the classics mm -hmm. that everyone should read. It should be about what is being written by young people now about today's world and today's realities. And we have, uh, I, uh, help me. I think we have only one contemporary yes. Armen Western Armenian writer, Christian, Christian Batikian, Batikian uh, who's published two novels. And uh, we had in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we had writers, but in the last mm. 20 years, we haven't. And so we need to encourage that because then that leads, as that having said, to a market. And then the type of stuff that uh, Olivia does brings in more people, younger people, uh, to read this literature. And then, and then you realize this is this is the trick how to make the language uh, revitalize or more, you know, give it some vitality. And that's that's the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was thinking when. Um... We were talking about the younger writers having the language to talk about contemporary issues. I don't think we're quite there yet with Western Armenian. This no, is, yeah, as I said, we have very few. Not there is a young group, mm -hmm. mostly diaspora, diaspora born, uh, not all of them French, but European Armenians, interestingly, European Armenians. There is a young group that is starting to write. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fiction in Western Armenia, they're in their 20s. So we're nourishing and encouraging them, you know, to, to they're going to hopefully start a literary journal. So they'll come onto the scene in Armenian, which will be something that hasn't really happened for so many decades in the diaspora to say, here we are, a new generation writing in Western Armenia. And, and then sort of, and again, we're not talking talking about hundreds of people. We're talking a dozen people, or you know, seven, eight. In nine France, uh, they're European. They're mostly in France. Yeah, it's mostly in France. That's wonderful um, but, to hear um, and to be encouraged yeah, and yeah. celebrated. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and it, it's it's a small group there that's uh, emerged out of our Zarmanazan program, but that's another hmm. story. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. So not only we need to encourage people to write and speak, but also translate. And I know Gallup thinks about some translation projects yes. as well. Yes, and it's been difficult to, because as Harad said, there's so much uh, to translate. It's been difficult with our first uh, translation grant to decide how to focus it. Um, and we've talked to Tatavik and Aravik about, you know, everyone has uh, their favorite uh, books that they want translated and, and series. And so it's, it's, it's difficult to 
to decide, you know, what to focus on because there just is so much out there to translate. But as we've said, when you do translate it and you create, uh, you create a demand for. So if you look at the Zabalia Cyan books, I mean, I, I, I think those have. We don't have data, but I think those have sold quite well. The English translations. Mm -hmm. um, In the United States, yeah. 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 Um, there are so many questions I can keep asking, but I think you had your hand up, Tatiana. Yeah, I, I have a question. Is there? Um, do you have to convince? Armenian writers to write in Armenian because I would suspect, as you mentioned, the Russian army, the Russian uh, writers, they probably think that there's more. They can't. Their work will be read more widely if they write in a particular language. So, do you have to convince people to write in Western or Eastern Armenian first before mm -hmm. writing in that other? No, no, not really. No, because uh, the writers uh, that are in the field in Armenia right now, they have they have already chosen their language and they write in Armenian. Of course, they want to be translated, but I don't know of any writer who would like to write in other language. Of course, there are conversations about that, but that's not a choice. You can't just go choose another language because your main language is Armenian and everybody writes mostly in Armenian. Uh, it's it's not no it's not an option to go uh, towards another language and this writers I mentioned their first language is Russian actually these are people were, who were born in the families with Russian speaking people post Soviet uh, times many families still were like most <clears throat> Russian speaking so. I think it's it's important though, you know, I, I think I know who you're talking about and the books that you're, the novels that well, at least one of them has done incredibly well among literary circles, among people that, you know, friends of mine who are not Armenian, but I will ask Armenian friends, have you read this? And they haven't heard of it before. So I think one thing that's so important for us to do is when there is a book that's published, that's, that's, that's uh, by a really talented writer to say, okay, how can we, um, disseminate this? How can we let people know? How can we uh, make sure that uh, it doesn't just, uh, you know, disappear into, into bookshelves and, and libraries? Um, and that's, you know, you mentioned poetry and how, how there are a lot of American Armenians writing poetry. And in fact, uh, Shahi Mankarian's debut collection of poetry, The History of Forgetfulness, which um, Huraj spoke to Shahi about uh, for, for an event here, was the publisher's, based in the UK, the publisher's best-selling uh, book of all time. Um, it's sold around the globe um, for a poetry collection that's pretty incredible. So if we, and, and, and we have worked hard to sort of help him in any way we can um, market the book and, and get the word out that he, he has this fantastic collection out there. So I think, you know, we need we need to support our, our, our writers and it's just, so important um, and when we do uh you know they can be even more successful so yeah you've done amazing so I, I just also want to this relates also to the first question you asked about what is armenian literature mm -hmm. i think we also need to be careful that we're not boxing literature that is being produced or written by armenians into this armenian box because it's a label that we use, the readers or the experts or the reviewers, but the author is trying to write for everyone. They're not saying that I'm gonna write this as a piece of Armenian literature or I'm writing this for my Armenian fellow Armenians. So I think we should also frame our uh, discussion when we're talking about these issues in a sense that it's it's universal and it, it's compatible with uh, universal human values that anyone, whether I mean or not, who reads this will find something of value or some connection with the literature, rather than saying that this is Armenian, Armenian American or whatever, because that's I think secondary construction on our part to label it. So I think 
in our discussions, we should keep this in mind that we're not boxing Armenian culture, Armenian literature, Armenian poetry, and whatever with these labels and narrow understandings, but keep it open because then it's going to have wider appeal to uh, many other nations. We don't have to explain what is Armenia and what is Armenia, whether they are Christian, because they're going to say, oh, wow. I know. I know I this can, book. I know yeah. I read it. Olivia is mentioning, I guess, Nane Abgarian's Three Apples, or mm -hmm. yeah, yes. yes. Apples yeah. Fell, from fell from the sky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, from the sky. It's uh, so she is writing in Russian, but she's writing about Armenian topics all the time because she's from the small town called Bert in Tavul region, bordering uh, on the border with Azerbaijan. And now it's translated into some probably 14 languages, mm -hmm. around 14 languages. And it does its job. I mean, people come to Armenia and they want to go mm. to Bert because mm -hmm. they read this book. So it's does it matter book. whether this is Armenian literature or Russian no, literature? No, it doesn't. Yeah. For Not us, yeah, yeah. It, no, it does. It's, it's, yeah. good. it's, it's good. It's good yeah. literature. It's good yeah. literature. It's 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 like you read a book in English about a village in Italy or yeah. in Greece, yeah. but it's not Greek, no. it's not Italian. It's literature. It's exactly. appealing to anyone. I'll try his book. Yeah, is universally applicable because it's about this war and destruction and the experience the horrors of yeah. the war. But then the reader goes further and looks into the writer. Mm. Who is he? Where yeah. is he yeah. from? What's the history behind right. this? Yeah, That's because it. often the background of the writer gives you more context to the world. And um, I don't know if how much of Parajin Giran's comment was audible on Zoom. Just to repeat quickly that about not labeling a writer just as Armenian author or Western Armenian author or even divided post-Setsi author or Soviet Armenian <laughs> second half of the 20th century <laughs> but, but good quality literature. You get Shahe Mankirian's book example who is an American Armenian with roots from Lebanon. Lebanon. Born in Lebanon. Born in Lebanon. We held a wonderful event together. You're based in Luxembourg, you're American, I'm from Armenia, based in London, Haraj, which is diverse background, random moderation, and we just enjoyed it. We connected, of course, we connected because there's an Armenian theme running through it, but we connected because it's just wonderful poetry. I think that's what matters in the end. Um, and another book that's coming out um, this year, Nancy Agabian's novel, The Fear of Large and Small Nations, it's coming out in October, I think, um, was a finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize in Socially Engaged Fiction. Uh, it's, a, you know, an American uh, prize. She was also a, a, a Lambda, um, she was awarded with a Lambda Award this year. And um, that is a book that has, it's about, you know, um, I think it goes between Queens and, and, and Yerevan, um, but it's about, I, I think as much as we try to get away from um, sometimes escape Armenian uh, issues, we can't, you know, I think a lot of Armenian writers still have these themes and, and characters and, and, and our culture embedded in our work, even if we, you know, try to write something else. Uh, but um, there are so many books that are coming out by authors in our community that speak to like Nancy's book, for example, is literary fiction. It's queer fiction. It's it's all it could fit in multiple categories, but it's also, I would say, uh, Armenian literature. So, yeah. I think uh, there are uh, quite a few questions on Zoom as well, and uh, I always have this dilemma with blended events: whose questions you take first. But then I'm thinking people here are going to get lots of wine, so I'm not starting to solve it. Yes, I have a fantastic team of colleagues sitting here, by the way, doing a lot of work. So my colleague Anushka will read out some, some okay. of the questions and comments. Okay. A significant need diaspora nation as a significant, sorry, as a significantly diaspora nation, how important is literature that it is also translated into on just uh, I'm not sure if it's audible on Zoom because we have the microphone here again, blended event, sorry. Right. So the question is, 
how significant it is to literature which is translated into Armenian. Global literature. Yeah, I think that's yeah, international yeah. literature. Yeah. Um, it's ingrained into, into our identity as a nation since at least the fifth century, fourth, fifth century to translate, right? Translation is really ingrained into what we do. We have formed our identity to as a nation to translations. The big literary celebration we have in the Armenian world is called Tarkman Chats to translate. So I think we have uh, kept that tradition, but we have lost it and it has become much weaker in the diaspora into, in Western Armenian. And that's one of the challenges that we are facing now that to modernize the language, it's thinking to encourage critical thinking, uh, to borrow what needs to be borrowed from other traditions, we need to translate. Our translation series is precisely for that. It's, it's uh, social science, Western texts uh, that have had a profound impact on our thinking in Europe and, and the United States in the West and how we conceive the world, how we understand power cannot be understood unless you read Foucault. You know, you don't have to read Foucault, but our notion of understanding power comes from Foucault, right? And, and that, <laughs> no, that's <laughs> it's one. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for you know, our understanding of uh, how history should be written comes from other, uh, you know, other sources. I don't want to keep mentioning names, but, um, and this needs to be available in Armenian. Living in diaspora is also a constant action of translating. You know, we all know this in our experience, right? Uh, um, we're constantly translating in our minds. We constantly, I listen to you speaking in Armenian. I take notes in English. Some phrases are half English, half Armenian. I uh, sometimes take notes in Armenian when English speak. I, I don't know why I do it, but it's, it's, it's one big confusion, but it's a constant translation. And we need to be able to capture that and make that available. So that's, uh, I think, very, very important part of who we are. Now, translating, that's translating from non-Armenian languages into Armenian. There's also the other side of translating from Armenian into other languages. But you know, I'll, I'll just stop there in terms of the significance and importance of our identity as diasporans and as our identity as Armenians, the importance of translation. Um, and in Armenia, it's a mechanism through which critical analysis, critical thinking is introduced into the country, which is also very important. That's true. And do you, do you publish translated literature, I think? Uh, no, we don't publish translated literature. Our partners do. We help them choose the titles. We help them find translators and means to do that. But... Um, translated literature is very important in terms of creating the language for the writers as well. I mean, the writers have to have this material translated into Armenian language to see the language in action. Because while you translate, you transfer this, you know, other cultures and new notions appear in your own language. Um, I just remembered that in one of his essays, Grigor Poltsian is talking about the languages and translation. And he says, only through learning other languages, you kind of recognize your own language and you value your own language. Mm -hmm. When you compare it with other languages or you when mm -hmm. you translate, you just kind of um, destruct and then construct the language and you get to know it better. So translations are very, very important. And we still have a long way to, do, to go in Armenia to have a better school of translation like styles of translation to, to have valuable stuff available in Armenian language, which will be helpful to writers, as I said, in their writing. Thank you. And that's why I guess Yala works with translators now. And I think the next question we have, you'll be the best person to answer. I had to read it twice to get it right. It's oh somewhat confusing. It's from Mama Takopian who says, are there known Armenian speaking Armenians who would like to read books about Armenians in other languages? Say it again. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there were a lot of words, Armenians in the same. Um, 
say, are there known Armenian speaking Armenians uh -huh. who would like to read books about, about Armenians in, in other world. languages? In English or French? Or yes. Probably. That's... And they're not Armenian. Me. Yeah. Like <laughs> me. About... That you would read a book in Italian as an Armenian who doesn't speak Armenian. You yeah. would read would a you... book about Armenians in Italian. Why not? I mean, that's the goal, right? Yeah. But yeah. as Saraj was saying, you know, you hope that a story is is universal, that that it that it reaches people on a human level, not on an Armenian level, or but on a on a human level. Um, and so, yes, I, I would absolutely hope that people would read uh, Armenian stories, Armenian literature in in Italian, in Japanese, in and a lot of books have been have been um, translated into, uh, as Arabic was saying, many many languages. Um, so. Yes. I hope I've answered that. Yes, ma'am. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> Do we have any more Zoom comments? Any, anything from the room? Any comments? Any, Susan? Yeah, I have a, this has been a fantastic evening, by the way. It's been really great. Um, we've talked a lot about creating the books from all different angles, but there was a brief mention of what happens once the book is a real thing. Um, and I just want a very brief story. I don't know if Maritza's on, on Zoom. But uh, she and I finished the book at the same time, way 100 years ago. And I remember her saying to me, uh, now, what are you going to do with the book? I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> you know, I'm going to go write another book. I've got five other ideas. And she said, no, 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 you can't just let this thing sit. You've got to do something with it. And of course, she wrote a one, one woman play and went all over the place to, mm -hmm. and talking about the book and, and getting people excited about it. And, a little earlier, we were we were talking about how to get people interested in that book. There's two things here, I think. One is nurturing the authors and maybe having um, supporting them in doing this and going around and doing book launches. Because I know at AI we found that if you have a book a book launch, that's a good talk. <laughs> you can usually sell every book on the table, but if you if somebody says, oh, I don't have my money tonight, they will not come back tomorrow and buy it. But, you know, it's just like, that's it. The night, it's all gone. It's sort of the event and the people being together and excited about the book in that moment. And, 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 they, and then it translates into buying. I'm wondering if, A, if there's other ideas on how to, what kind of events, how to get people excited about the books after they're done. And, and my second, just a quick plea would be for um, support for authors getting together to, with each other on retreats, perhaps, or things like that, where they can also speak more Armenian together. And that might promote more things happening. And I believe there is a project that was just funded to, to, to host a storytelling festival in Lorry. Um, you know. That's a great idea. Uh, I don't know. Well, festival. Uh, if either of you want to. to, to uh, yeah, just in short, the industry works the following way. If you find the right publisher, the publisher does the job. I mean, they not only publish, but they distribute it to bookstores. They do some marketing. They organize the events. This is the ideal way <laughs> to do it. Yeah, <laughs> they don't do it. Of course, we understand. Yeah, we understand that they don't do it. But there is no other way you can do it. If the writer himself or herself is proactive, can use social media, can go out, meet people and tell about his book, can talk to journalists, critics, literary critics, so that they can write reviews, that will work. Otherwise, of course, that's a huge problem. So for me, the solution is just to try to find the best publisher possible who will do this for them. And then also be kind of active how to do it. Uh, we about getting together the writers, Penn, um, Penn Center, many of you probably know. Now we also, Armenia has Penn Center mm -hmm. Armenia. It's a recent thing. And just recently we had a gathering, a conference of Pan Armenia. And it was like wonderful for many years, these writers didn't get together. It was around 50 of them. So there are this kind of means centers, clubs, whatever, when writers can uh, get together and talk to each <coughs> other and, you know, find solutions to their problems.
Uh, can I add to that? Uh, Susan, you put your finger on the most difficult, uh, challenging problem that we have in, in, this, in this field, uh, especially in the diaspora, but I think also in Armenia. Um, publishing books, writing books, publishing books is the easy part. Mm -hmm. Distributing them. Uh, okay, <laughs> authors don't agree. Oh, right. <laughs> authors yes. don't agree. Yeah, I don't know about that. There uh, was an audible problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's put it, it's the easier part, yeah. not the easiest part. It's the easier <laughs> part. Distributing those books, uh, it's a very, very big problem. Um, physically distributing them, uh, getting them across borders. I'll give you the example of uh, anything that's sent to Portugal out of the European Union, I don't get them. Mm -hmm. They disappear in customs. And if I do get them for each, if it's one book or one box of books, doesn't matter. I have to pay 130 euros to process that to customs in addition to custom fees. So, so distributing them has become such a difficult task to do, um, adding to the expenses. So the, the children's books that, that I showed, uh, Everything is subsidized. The translation, the, well, it's paid for, not subsidized. The translation, the printing, uh, the editing, everything is paid for by the foundation to make it available. And yet the book is still is, you know, uh, $10 or 10 euros uh, in Armenia or in Lebanon. And no parent can pay that in Lebanon or in Syria where there are this, uh, the, the readership. Okay, in the United States, they could perhaps. So, um, it's it, the pricing distribution. These are big problems, and we are think trying to think of some sort of a solution for this. Uh, so far, we haven't found that magic solution. Electronic books is the answer, but that's that's the that's an, for children's book. That's not the answer, but for other books, mm -hmm. that might be the answer to actually go completely electronic, and uh, and then have self publishing. People just print the books if they want to print the books themselves. So that's something that we're thinking about to ad address the, the distribution thing, because otherwise it's very, very difficult to distribute books now. Despite all the talk of globalization, this domain has become even less globalized. Yeah, I agree, especially after yeah. Brexit, it's become very difficult yeah. to, to order books from here. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, I remember, and I'll date myself here, but when I was a kid, Black Dog of Fate came out and there was a, I, I mean, there was a huge push to get as many copies of this book to as many non-Armenians as possible. And I remember my mother got it for all my teachers that year for Christmas. Um, and, you know, all these people now knew about the Armenian genocide, which is fantastic. And I think that when they're, you know, yes, you, as you say, writers have to go out and do book talks, but we are generally a very um solitary people you know they, and, and not everyone is is terribly sociable um and it's become much more difficult now i think people are really tired of uh, no offense um uh people have some zoom fatigue but not for the army and institute um, but, but uh, no but 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 um i mean it's a, it's a it's a big thing so ha you can expect so much from a writer you can expect so much from a publisher you can help hope to get the best publisher and still have to do some of that marketing on your own. But I think sure. a lot of books are sold from word of mouth. I bought uh, um, uh, three apples because Tatevik told me to read it. So I said, okay, I trust Tatevik. I'm going to buy the book. Uh, but we have to be talking about books. We have to say, you know, as part of Yala's um, Before Christmas, we, we got a holiday book list together. Um, all the books that we knew of that had been written in, in, in uh, by Armenian authors that, that in the last year. And um, I hope to do the same thing every year. So you can say, I'd like to buy, you know, my uh, seven-year-old nephew a book, which, which one should I get? Um, you know, we, we have to be talking about books. We have to be gifting books. Um, non-writers have to be su supporting writers too, uh, mm -hmm. because writers can only go to so many book launches and um, still be environmentally yeah. friendly. One of the things we're discussing with that, uh, with uh, Arabic now, for example, is um, how to introduce the culture of writing book reviews in Armenia. There is no culture of writing book mm -hmm. reviews yeah. for, for the academic books. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, Susan said, it's published, it's done, fine. 
Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So nobody knows about the yeah. book. But uh, so, one of the things yeah. we're trying to do at Yala is create a network of book reviewers. So if someone yeah. comes to me and says, Olivia, I just published this book. Can you help me? And I say, okay, I've created a network of newspapers that I'm going to send it to. And I'm going to send it to my network of book reviewers and say, who's interested in reviewing this book? Um, and hopefully have two or three people from different countries or different parts, different communities who are going to review a book and 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 there I think there is um, uh, there is a want for this there is newspapers have been very welcoming um, you know when I've sent sent out uh, especially the Armenian Weekly they have a huge literary corner um, publications non Armenian publications like the LA Review of Books um, publishes a lot of of mm -hmm. um, published just something just about generation independence and, and how yes. wonderful work with your superheroes. Um, but, but, you know, we have to be going after that and saying, coming together as a community and saying, okay, I have this person who wrote this book. I need you to pitch it to this person, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, this is how it, this is how it works. Yeah. Thank you for all the amazing ideas and uh, let's treasure our writers. Let's support them. Um, we have one question as well on Zoom from our wonderful AI friend, Armin Akhtopalian, who's been one of the London Book Fair organizers and the main organizer is sitting across me, Shaumalas, who is sort of hoping that I will not ask him a question. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, could, I could read the explanation. But Armin says, can you just give your views how, how successful uh, was the fair? Was there interest in... Armenian literature. What what was your takeaway from it? You will give everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, I will find out who really did some work. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was there to do that, and uh, it was very successful for me. It was amazing because I haven't been to book fairs for around three years, starting with COVID, and then uh, during other book fairs we also had the war. And then some book fairs were also canceled around the world because of uh, COVID. So, and many, many others also during the book fair, they, everybody was so happy to be back to in-person book fair. It was amazing. And the most important thing I want to say about this book fair is uh, participation is very important for the country. I mean, Armenia is there. That's the most important thing. Even if few publishers came from Armenia, uh, even if I had less meetings than I usually have, but having this, you know, written Armenian pavilion, us sitting there, having Armenian cognac and some dried fruit over the tables. She was, I can't, <laughs> she was getting everyone drunk at 10 a.m. She yeah. 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 The the brandy. yeah, it was brandy. That's, <laughs> but that's a strategy that everybody uses. Publishing is a very personal field. I mean, whether the book is success or not, whether you can sell the book to a publisher or not, it depends on your personal relationship with the editor, with the publisher. If you can kind of hook him in something, the topic of the book, the cognac, I don't know, the dried food, that's candy. the most, yeah, Grand Candy. Candace, that's, oh, yeah. that's very, that's very important candy. because you need to be remembered. And I still have, I was telling you guys that I still have some partners I work with for a long time and they just come over every time to our stand for Brandy. They come and say, <laughs> hello, do you have some? Yes, a sip. And then they go away. But these are people that we work with and we are successful in our relationship with them. And they have been to Armenia. They are coming for a holiday sometimes which is like amazing like german people coming to armenia to see armenia because they know us because they read the book of our author so uh, it was an amazing fair thank you everyone who helped to make it happen and um, i think we for the success of armenian literature and its promotion we need to be able to participate to as many events like book fair and conferences and other events as possible. We need to have our name out there for everybody every time and then it, it will work and it will have its results. So yeah. it was amazing for yeah. us. Yeah, I'd like to echo your words. It was just fantastic to be part of the pavilion, sit there and feel you're representing 
this very diverse literature from Foucault to ch children's <laughs> book. And, Did you, you see know, the I queue? Mean, People <laughs> waiting to see Foucault, I mean, <laughs> living in Foucault. Uh, Armenian <laughs> Institute had, they had our offerings there, um, Firmelian Sayasco, ladies and gentlemen, our latest acquisition, Mashdok's Press. Uh, uh, translations and it was just wonderful to go around and meet everyone be just immersed in that atmosphere and see everyone's pavilions which which was an amazing cultural experience i think first day uh, my colleagues are sitting here shahika did a lot of work there went and talked to a lot of people and uh, they tried to talk to what they called neighbor countries to show some books and they went to find the i site. went to georgia you went to georgia and we went to find cyprus and the first day they hadn't set out they were <laughs> The first day was, it was the funnest. Yes, I did that on the second day. We had lots of coffee at the Charger Pavilion. So it was it was wonderful learning experience. And I hope we'll continue and we'll have Richard present. And thank you, Charles, for organizing all that. It's a pain worth, worth suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, you mentioned, you asked before what I would like to see. Um, and I do stand by my answer that I want people to write what they're, they're passionate about. But I also think, uh, well, my, one of my personal um, passions is, is uh, writing climate fiction, environmental fiction, environmental stories. Uh, and another thing that I think is, and I'd love to hear if there are any environmental stories coming out of Armenia, but another thing that I think is supremely important, especially since 2020, are um, stories out of Artsakh. And I think, you know, I've seen documentary series and, and documentaries are coming out. I think in, in the film world, this is happening. And what, you know, are there books or short stories in the works about this uh, and the anthology? How can we, you know, help get more stories out there? Yeah, of course, there are uh, wonderful short stories. There have been wonderful short stories. What's amazing is by women writers. And we are uh, expecting at least one collection of short stories oh. and a novel on, on war. Uh, as for the, you know, um, male writers that I work with, um, it's interesting, but they still need some time to kind process. of digest, to process before yeah. writing. Uh, the same happened with the first Artsakh War. We had books about Artsakh War, but quite some time mm -hmm. later. It needs some, you know, digestion. Yeah. It needs some time to settle down. But we have wonderful women stories, women voices of war, which are about Artsakh, but they are actually about peace and not war. We do have it. We, it is happening. It might be slow because we're going through a lot, especially those in Armenia and in Artsakh. They are going through very difficult times and. While not all the bodies of our soldiers are found, not all the um, soldiers who are in Azerbaijan right now returned home, it's very difficult to mm -hmm. refer to the topic. So, yeah, still, still too well. yes. are still um, I think we're about to finish soon, and I think my colleagues have shared or are about to share a few links to fill in a feedback form and get in touch with us if you have any ideas or questions for our participants. And also I'd like to remind everyone yet again, like famous, famous meme that with all this event, with your help and with your donations. So if we have a donation link somewhere in the chat as well, please go there, every little helps and it will allow us to run more events, more conversations like this. I hope we inspire people to go and read and write in any language you want. You want to write <laughs> about any topic you want, environmental fiction or queer sci-fi. As as I will say Peter Blakin just published a poetry collection, which may, I, I haven't read it yet because I didn't have it at Blackwell's, but they, it may, uh, I think it does deal with some environmental uh, themes. So there you go. There's my pay. Donate to the um, Armenian Institute. Um, we're, we're both, <laughs> uh, yes, and we're going to have a launch for Peter's book with Yala, or Yala, June. June 5th. June 5th. Yeah. And neither of us has read it. No. <laughs> Oh. It's very hard to get so books in Luxembourg. But... So that's it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? 
No, I think we covered all the. What is Armenian word? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the one thing I would say regarding the book fair question is uh, let's not also forget that it's a professional trade book, uh, book fair. And be, behind the scenes, behind all the PR and presenting Armenia, actually deals take place. So you sell rights and you buy rights in Armenia. It's the mechanism through which all we've been talking about takes place. Yes. The, the, the people to people, person to person. Uh, for example, I met someone there that just answered some of my questions regarding one of our projects in five minutes. I knew what the story was and what the situation is. And so, and, and it's the opportunity to do that kind of thing. So that's, I think, important, but, um, but anyway. Yeah. No, we sold, yeah, the, the greatest news for me was that we sold the German rights of Adam Bachian's uh, European prize winning novel to Swiss publisher. Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Can I very quickly just add something with, to add to what uh, Rasmus said and you guys? That the out, one of the outcomes that were personally touched me is that one of the uh, stand opposite the Armenian civilian, actually knowing that uh, Armenians and the neighbors were Armenian in LA and what have you, they linked us with a company called uh, Books International, who happen to, which happens to be owned by an Armenian family who can possibly solve the distribution problem. Okay, there you go. So we will link, uh, we will link the two companies together once they come to this. Okay. So that's uh, that's, 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 that could be a, a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. Wonderful news. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. in your project, translations, writing, publishing, distributing, getting yes. people to read heavy philosophers or yeah. writing <laughs> one of books. Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you very much, everyone, on Zoom. Bye-bye. No